Okay, we got to talk about the Obi-Wan Kenobi TV show and why it's so bad. All right, so before we get to the problems with the Obi-Wan Kenobi TV show, I just want to take a minute and say that if you like the show and you're enjoying it, all the more power to you. Uh, the point of this video is really to kind of point out some of the storytelling issues that I have a problem with, because in my experience, if you like a show that's poorly made, you're going to like it when it's well made. And the people who don't like the show when it's poorly made will end up liking it if it's well made. So the point here is to try to point out the proper way of using storytelling techniques uh, in the hopes that in the future, people who are you know involved in these beloved franchises and stuff like that can actually go back and look at some of the uh, mistakes that they made and fix those mistakes. Because like, you know, if you're always kind of catering to the lowest common denominator who like whatever is put out, um, you're never going to actually improve. And a lot of the problems with fandom nowadays is the fact that you have people out there who are considered toxic and overly critical and all that stuff. But a lot of that stuff comes from the fact that they're such hardcore fans of the property that they just want good stories. And when they're not given good stories, they tend to be hypercritical about the stuff that they are getting. And, and I'd say about 90% of them don't know how to verbalize the issues that they have with the stuff that they're getting. And so what I hope to do in this video is to kind of point out the stuff that doesn't work with Obi-Wan Kenobi and kind of verbalize a lot of the frustration that uh, the hardcore fans have with this material because you got to remember that a lot of the quote unquote toxic fans out there they're they love star wars they want good star wars and they're just not getting good star wars and there's a certain part of the fan base that will just love anything with the word star wars attached to it so you know we're not catering to the extremes here we're catering to the middle and the people in the middle just want a very good well-told story and the things I'm going to point out in this video are issues that prevent the story of Obi-Wan from being told well. And so what I would really want to do is dive deep into the storytelling techniques that uh, this TV series is kind of like missing the mark on in the hopes that going forward, the people at Lucasfilm will know what to avoid and what to improve upon. And so in this sense, I'm not trying to be toxic. I'm not trying to be hypercritical. I'm not trying to be nitpicky. I'm just trying to be very matter of fact. Here are good sound storytelling techniques that need to be followed in order to maximize audience enjoyment across the board for pretty much anything Star Wars related. All right, so Obi-Wan Kenobi is bad. Not the character, I mean the TV show. And the reason I'm saying this is not because I'm someone who hates everything Star Wars, hates everything Disney Star Wars, and wants Star Wars to fail. Far from it. I'm actually a huge Star Wars fan. Um, I like The Mandalorian. Uh, I like uh, Rogue One. I'm not a big fan of the direction Disney has taken things with their Star Wars properties. But I'm always rooting for new Star Wars to be good because I'm I'm willing to give new creators the benefit of the doubt. I'm willing to let them impress me and bring me back into the fold of liking Star Wars once more. The problem here is that the people that they have working on the Obi-Wan Kenobi TV show uh, fell into the same trap that uh, the, the Star Wars sequels fell into and a lot of the, the spinoffs and stuff like that, which is basically they've hired people who, number one, don't understand good storytelling, and number two, don't really understand Star Wars. And I don't know why this keeps happening, because pretty much everyone in Hollywood would bend over backwards to work on a Star Wars property. And so when you have unlimited resources and unlimited talent to pull from, you'd think that you could find someone who just is at least decent at writing a story, you know? And when it comes to uh, Star Wars under Kathleen Kennedy's regime, she seems to have failed time and time again in finding like actual talented storytellers to shepherd the Star Wars saga forward, um, particularly when it comes to uh, beloved characters like Obi-Wan Kenobi. Now, uh, I wanna bring you guys back to 2019 and refresh your memory when Kathleen Kennedy said this. I can tell you we are really close. We have all the scripts written. We are ready to start shooting next year. Um, we could not be more excited. 
Yeah, so Kathleen Kennedy said they had all the scripts written, everything was ready to go into production, they were going to get it going right away and have it out within, you know, the next year or so. And uh, then this happened. Now, there are lots of reasons that I've heard as to why uh, the Obi-Wan Kenobi series went on hiatus. Basically, uh, Kathleen Kennedy's official explanation is that the scripts were too dark, and so they needed time to retool them to make them more hopeful, I guess. Um, but the other rumor I've heard is that the original Obi-Wan Kenobi scripts were very, very similar to the scripts that Jon Favreau had written for the first season of The Mandalorian. Uh, basically, it was either Obi-Wan with Luke or Obi-Wan with Leia, and uh, it was kind of like the same thing where he had to keep them safe, and uh, it's pretty much what happened in the first season of The Mandalorian. But, you know, both of those things are just derivatives from the um, old story of Lone Wolf and Cub, which is about a father and his, like, little baby son, and he has to protect the son and all that stuff. So, you know, uh, Star Wars uh, continues to be a little bit derivative in, in that respect. But all that being aside, basically, the rumor is that Favreau and Filoni told Kathleen Kennedy, like, hey, you can't go into production with Obi-Wan because it's too similar to the show that we have coming out right now. And so she basically had to put the brakes on and uh, retool the uh, entire series. And they didn't know how long that was going to take or like, you know, they didn't know who was going to kind of like shepherd the, the writing process and all that stuff. So they just said that it was going to be on an indefinite hiatus until they could fix things. And this has kind of, kind of been Kathleen Kennedy's MO for a while, where basically like she pulls the trigger on something, she gets the wrong people involved in it, and then it becomes a complete mess and she has to stop it and, uh, and kind of retool things and try to salvage whatever it is that she can. That was the case with Solo. Now, one of the interesting things about Kenobi is that if you guys remember, I don't, I don't know if anyone actually remembers this because it was like so long ago, but uh, for us old farts like myself, uh, we have uh, a little bit of a longer memory. And if you go back to like the 2013-2014 uh, time frame where Disney had just acquired Star Wars for $4 billion and Kathleen Kennedy was named as George Lucas' successor, and all this stuff and suddenly she was in charge of like the biggest franchise in the world with unlimited funds and unlimited resources with which to do what she wanted and Kathleen Kennedy's um, philosophy has always been it's about the characters it's a very big universe I've created and there's a lot of stories that are sitting in there the main thing is to protect these characters make sure that they still continue to, to live in the way that you created them and that the universe of Star Wars continues to grow. That's her thing. She's like, oh, we have all these wonderful characters in Star Wars. People love the characters, so let's just make movies about the characters. And so back in the 2014 time frame, before uh, The Force Awakens came out, uh, Kathleen Kennedy was in active development for a bunch of different Star Wars movies, and they were all based around characters. So like, the plan was to have like a Star Wars... Uh, sequel come out like an actual episode so like episode seven eight and nine every other year and then in those in between years they were going to have a character centric star wars story they had focused on having a boba fett uh standalone movie they were there was talk about a yoda standalone movie they were going to have a, a han solo standalone movie which eventually you know came to fruition they were going to do a uh you know a kind of prequel to um, episode four, which eventually became uh, Rogue One, and uh, Obi Wan Kenobi was, you know, going to be a standalone movie as well. They were going to go back to Obi Wan Kenobi, Yoda, Boba Fett, and Han Solo, and so that was kind of like her strategy, where he's like, where she basically said, "Let's take these characters that everyone loves, and let's give them their own movie." And so it was in this time frame that uh, you know they start developing what would, would become the Obi Wan Kenobi TV show. And uh, my guess is, like, they took that script, uh, put it in a drawer back when, you know, everything started, like, going wrong for, for the franchise. And they were like, once they pivoted to TV, they were like, okay, let's dust this script off and let's turn it into a TV show, which they probably did. And then when they realized that uh, the scripts didn't work, they had to go on indefinite hiatus. And that's kind of, like, typical MO for uh, Kathleen Kennedy. Now, the real problem here is that whoever she got to kind of retool the series, 
uh, either had to work off of these scripts that they already had and just kind of like re rejigger them, or they had to come up with something completely new. And, and again, they didn't know what they were doing. So the purpose of you know this little video essay that I'm making uh, here is that you know I'm not going to bash the creative choices that they made because I don't want to go back and, and try to like rewrite history, right? Uh, they made this TV show. It's out. We're consuming it. Um, the purpose of this is to actually look at what they've delivered upon. And this is, you know, it could be a failure of writing or it could be a failure of directing or it could be a failure of overall creative vision. But I'm just going to be looking at the choices that they made and commenting on why they're bad and how they're going to impact this show going forward. Now, one of the biggest problems, I think, with Kenobi is that the very first episode is extremely slow. And this is a pacing issue. Uh, for those of you who might not know what pacing means, it ju just means the flow of the story. A well-paced story has ebbs and flows, right? It goes fast sometimes, and it slows down, and it, then it ramps back up again. Um, a movie that is always ramping up, or a story that is always ramping up, is one that is is too breakneck and too exhausting, right? Like, like you just get burnt out watching it. So you need those slow moments in order to kind of process what it is you just watched during the fast moments. And likewise, if something is far too slow, you get bored and it becomes laborious and uh, you start, you know, losing the audience's attention. And so you need to oscillate between, um, you know, fast pace and slow pace in order to properly pace a TV show or a movie or a story in general. And that's just basic, uh, you know, storytelling 101 is like pace yourself uh, the correct way and you'll keep the audience engaged and interested. Now the problem with uh, Kenobi episode one is that it is extremely slow paced. You know, they, they tried to open it up with a bang by having like the Inquisitors show up in, in, at, in um, Tatooine uh, or what have you. I don't even know what city that is. I'm guessing it's Moss Eisley, but you know, who knows? Like they, they never really bothered to establish it, but uh, they have like a, a short scene where basically they find a random Jedi and he like runs away and it's not really a fast paced scene. It, it's very much meant to be an establishing scene. They're kind of like establishing the, the scenario that the, the episode's starting with. But then like you get like a long period of time of Obi wan Kenobi uh, making space whale sushi out in the desert and uh, just showing like his, his, you know, kind of like bleak existence where he's living in a cave. Like he doesn't even have a proper uh, sand igloo. He's just like living out of a cave for some reason. And uh, they take their sweet time showing, you know, just how far Obi-Wan Kenobi has fallen from his, his previous glory. And, you, you know, uh, I, I got to wonder why they're doing this, because this is what in Hollywood terms we call the prodigal hero trope, which is basically uh, something that was based off of the story of Moses, where you have someone who uh, was once a, a, at the height of their power, at the height of luxury and stuff like that, and they fall from grace in some way and they retreat and they become kind of like uh, bitter or exiled or something like that. And then uh, events happen that force them to kind of come back, recapture their former glory, and uh, lead some type of like charge against uh, some greater evil. And uh, they tried this with The Last Jedi with Luke Skywalker and, well, we all know how that turned out. So you'd think that they learned their lesson here, um, but no, it's pretty much uh, Jake Skywalker 2.0 with Jake Kenobi. Um, and we all know how much we love seeing our heroes devolve into bitter, old, uh, washed up characters that are a shadow of their former glory. One of the things that they could have done is basically have Obi-Wan uh, remain stalwart and, you know, use those 10 years between uh, Revenge of the Sith and this story to basically, uh, you know, hide, but like, you know, improve himself, train, maintain his, his, his powers, and be ready to train Luke when the time is right. But of course, they don't do that. Instead, uh, we get a broken character that is very depressing to watch, and they make us watch him for like a good hour uh, before like he kind of gets back on the rails, but he, he's still not the character that we all know and love. He's J um, Jake Obi-Wan. So, I mean, there's a problem here, right? So basically they take our main character and they make him as miserable and pathetic as possible. And then they want us to kind of like root for him. And everyone who's coming to this show is like, hey, 
where's the Obi-Wan that I saw in the prequels? Like, that's the one, the guy who jumps down into the middle of uh, a band of, of very highly trained soldiers, and he's just like, hello there, and then he whips out his lightsaber and, and does his business. So, like, you know, people, fans of the franchise want to see that Obi-Wan Kenobi. And that's one of the big problems with modern Star Wars is that um, the people making the Star Wars content don't seem to understand what it is their audience wants. Um, I think the closest that we ever got was with The Force Awakens, where J.J. Abrams kind of knew all the member berries that the Star Wars fans have been thirsting for ever since the, the prequel tr trilogy ended. And that's one of the reasons why he was able to get away with so much crap in The Force Awakens, is because he was just feeding the Star Wars fans exactly what it was that they wanted. And I think that, you know, when you're able to do that, but also tell a solid good story, that's when magic happens. And the problem here is that the first episode of Obi-Wan, they're trying to tell a very serious story. And people don't want this type of serious story, right? They, they want to get right into the character of Obi-Wan that they all remember very fondly. And they're not doing a very good job of presenting the character in the way he needs to be presented in order to capture the, um, the favor of the audience. And this is really kind of um, exemplified in the scene between Obi-Wan and Owen Lars. So basically, uh, there's a scene in the movie where Obi-Wan saves up enough credits to buy a little toy for Luke, and he goes and he puts the toy at the, the Owen Lars, Lars farm uh, doorstep. And basically, uh, Owen Lars tracks him down in town uh, the next day, uh, gives him back the toy and says, you know, like, stay away from Luke. You know, he's um, off limits to you. And uh, Obi-Wan's like, we talked about this. Uh, when the time comes, the boy must be trained. And so, like, you have this weird situation here where you have a character who's basically cut himself off from the Force. He's, uh, he's defeated. He's basically withdrawn from society, and he he doesn't do anything, right? He just sits in his cave, he, he does work, he eats, he takes care of his uh, little uh, alpaca animal, and, and that's pretty much it. And so, like, y you can't have a character who is basically beaten down, given up, and defeated, who has cut himself off from the Force, doesn't do any training, uh, isn't perfecting his skills, isn't preparing to... Uh, for a time where he can like come back and basically right the wrongs that were done and uh, s somehow turn the tide against uh, the dark side and also uh, have someone who wants to train Luke to be a Jedi. Th those two things don't kind of fit together, right? So like either he's perfecting his skills and learning from his mistakes so that he can properly train Luke to become the new hope and defeat his father and bring restore balance to the force and all that stuff that he was charged with doing at the end of episode three, Revenge of the Sith, or he's a beaten, defeated um, hermit who has withdrawn from the force, withdrawn from the Jedi, and basically is just waiting to die. You know, so like you can't have both those things be true at the same time. And this is one of the big problems with um, the Obi-Wan Kenobi TV series is that they don't know what character they're writing for, right? So, like, they're trying to have it both ways, and it doesn't work like that. So e either Kenobi is stalwart in his belief of, of the Jedi Code and that he's got a mission and that he needs to perform that mission, or he's Jake Kenobi and he's just there waiting to die. Both of those things can have a character arc to them. Both of those things can have a character journey. You know, um, if he is there, you know, waiting to train Luke, uh, he's got to actively hide and he's got to protect Luke. And there's all types of stuff that he can be doing that makes it interesting for him. Like he could feel guilty for, you know, being the one that let Anakin fall to the dark side. And so there could be a redemption arc for him. Uh, when it comes to uh, being the hermit and being the recluse and being Jake Kenobi, uh, you know, there are possibilities there where he could potentially, you know, eventually come to learn that like, you know, okay, this was my fault, but I have to rise up to become the hero I need to be, basically become the prodigal hero, uh, which seems to be uh, the direction that they're going. Anyway, getting back to the pacing issue with episode one, typically as a writer, you want to start right in the middle of some type of action 
that will propel the story forward, you know, get rid of all the boring bits and just like keep moving the plot along. Because even though characters are important, plot is really the thing that's going to keep the audience engaged. So in the slower moments, like, you know, we talked about pacing before, in the slower moments, you kind of want to focus on character. And then in, in the faster moments, you kind of want to focus on plot. And, and that oscillation between character and plot is what keeps the story moving forward. It's like a perpetual motion machine, right? So just when you're starting to get bored with the character stuff, all of a sudden something fun happens and you know, you're whisked along at like a rapid pace. And then just as you're about ready to get uh, exhausted by that pace, it slows down, goes back to the character moments. And, and that's how you properly build you know, a, a narrative, right, um, by doing the proper pacing. Now, the problem here with Obi-Wan Episode 1 is that the pacing is extremely slow. They focus on a lot of character stuff and not a lot of action. So what if Episode 1 had started off with the kidnapping of Princess Leia? That was like the opening where we, we establish uh, Alderaan, we, we get to see Bail Organa, and we get to be introduced to 10-year-old Princess Leia. And, you know, she's, you know, kidnapped and then we cut to Tatooine we get to see kind of like the state that Obi-Wan is in and then boom within like the first 15-20 minutes of the episode uh, he's being called to come rescue Leia and then like he has to struggle with uh, you know leaving uh, Luke uh, just as the Inquisitors are showing up and going off and, and saving the, the princess so um, right away like when you cut out all that preamble and stuff like that um, you, you get a much better paced show because like, you know, you establish the um, actual story scenario right up front and then the character goes off and, and he has to, um, you know, basically deal with all these different conflicts. And that's what makes a show interesting. But instead we get like 30 to 40 minutes of him being like, you know, uh, wishy-washy and reluctant and all this other stuff. And I get the whole reluctant hero trope, uh, refusing the call to action. That's very typical for a, a typical uh, hero's journey story but at the same time it's like you have to understand that like the uh, the reluctance has to come from each subsequent obstacle so he may not want to go and rescue Leia at first but then like he resolves to and then something comes up that challenges that resolve where you know like the Inquisitors show up and he's like well should I really leave Luke and, and go off and, and save Leia and so he has to find allies or he has to find some solution to that problem before he can go off and, and rescue Leia and stuff like that and so like that you know you keep putting obstacles in front of your main character that he has to resolve before he can continue on his journey. And that's just typical good writing. You know, you put your hero up a tree and you chuck rocks at him and you keep chucking rocks at him until it's time uh, for him to climb out of that tree. Um, and the the first episode of Obi-Wan doesn't do that, right? Like, it's, it's just like, basically, it spends an hour just showing us how miserable Obi-Wan is. And then at the end, he's like, okay, well, I guess I'll go save the little girl princess who's just as important as the kid I'm supposed to be watching over whose uncle doesn't want anything uh, to do with me. All right, so let's take a minute to talk about story logic. Now, what is story logic? Basically, story logic is does the narrative that the audience is watching make sense within the context of the story being told? And there are a couple of different ways of looking at story logic. So basically, does the story that we're consuming make sense within the context of the narrative that we're being presented? And is it consistent with what we, the audience, know to be true uh, in an external capacity. Mm -hmm. So what I mean by that is you have story logic and you have external logic. And a good example of this is if you're watching an action movie, for instance, and someone has a six shooter revolver that only hold, holds six bullets and they're run running around and they're shooting this gun uh, a thousand different times without reloading, your external logic will kick in and say, hey, wait a minute, that gun only has six shots in it. How come they, they're not stopping to reload? How come they keep shooting bullet after bullet after bullet? And uh, it's way more than six bullets. And so that's an example of external logic kind of impacting an audience's suspension of disbelief while watching a movie. Now, within the context of the story, if the movie that we're watching says, oh, this is a magic gun that has unlimited ammo, so you don't need to stop and reload it. It can just shoot forever and ever. And, uh, you know, that's that. As long as they set that up within the story, the story logic of someone running around with a six-shot revolver never having to reload and, and shooting thousands and thousands of rounds makes sense because the story bothered to set that up. And we as the audience are like, okay, our external logic uh, has been trumped by the uh, story logic. 
So we're just going to go along with it and continue our willing suspension of disbelief and enjoy the movie that we're being presented with. But uh, a, a big sign of bad writing is when people kind of ignore story logic, when they ignore the story consistency, the logic consistency within the story itself, and external consistency to combine with what uh, eventually become plot holes or plot contrivances, or basically just like bad writing is what it amounts to ultimately. So let's talk about this in the context of the first episode of Obi-Wan. So one of the issues with uh, the first episode of Obi-Wan is that the, the show establishes very early on that it's been 10 years since the events of Revenge of the Sith. Obi-Wan has been in hiding that entire time. And these Inquisitors, who are like the elite Jedi hunters from the Empire, have been looking for him for about 10 years and have yet to find him. And there's this one Inquisitor in particular. Her name is Reva. Um, she's the one who's kind of obsessed with finding Obi-Wan. And, uh, you know, she hasn't been able to find him. Now, in this story... The, the show opens up with them tracking down a random Jedi on Tatooine who they found because of some rumor somewhere that brought them to this far out of the way outer rim planet where they land in their, their spaceship and three of them walk out and within like seconds they find this Jedi hiding out in a cantina. So they're very good at, at basically following rumors and innuendo and, and tracking down these random Jedi. And this Jedi ends up getting away in a very contrived method, by the way. Like, he basically uh, runs away, throws down a little kind of like awning, and the Inquisitors are powerless to run after him, pursue him, and, and capture him, it seems. So, like, they just kind of let him go. And throughout the course of this story, like, we, we get introduced to Obi-Wan, his life. And at a certain point, this random Jedi tracks him down in the middle of the desert, mind you. And they try to justify this by giving the random Jedi a line by saying like, oh, I, I saw you in town, I recognized you, and I followed you out here, and you need to help me, I have nowhere else to go. And Obi-Wan, of course, refuses him. So um, the story logic here is, is, is very flawed in the sense that Obi-Wan has successfully eluded being discovered by the Inquisitors for 10 years. And these are people who can go anywhere based off of like rumor, innuendo, force powers, like whatever, to track down Jedi. And yet they haven't been able to find him for 10 years. This is established in, in the story. And yet this random Jedi can track him down in the middle of the desert uh, through like a random glance when, you know, Obi-Wan has been very careful to kind of like keep a low profile on this planet. And that is a story logic inconsistency, right? So, like, if they wanted to really set up that this random Jedi found Obi-Wan, they should have showed him seeing him in town and following him out into the desert and stuff like that. But they don't do any of that stuff. He just kind of randomly comes upon Obi-Wan in the desert and begs him for help and then gets refused. That's a story logic problem, right? Because basically you're saying that these Inquisitors, who are very competent and we're supposed to be afraid of them, um, they can't do what this random... Jedi who we've never seen before this series does, and that is track down Obi-Wan after 10 years of hiding. So a second aspect to this is that later on the Inquisitors find this Jedi because Obi-Wan refused to help him, and they end up killing him. They string him up in the town square of Mos Eisley or wherever the hell that town is. And uh, basically the idea here is that at the beginning of the, the episode, the Grand Inquisitor keeps Reva from killing this Jedi because he wants to interrogate him because the whole purpose of them capturing Jedi is to find out leads on more Jedi. And so like they use their, their uh, Sith uh, mind probe uh, powers to kind of interrogate them and, and learn what they know. And then once they've gotten all the information they can out of them, that's when they kill them. At least that's how in canon Inquisitors operated. Um, we've seen this in like the TV show, the, the cartoon shows and the comic books and the books and stuff like that. So it's well established that the Inquisitors operate in this method. So after this random Jedi found Obi-Wan, what should have happened according to the internal logic of the story is that the Inquisitors should have interrogated him, used the mind probe technique, and learned that Obi-Wan was somewhere on the planet and then start hunting down Obi-Wan. That should have been, you know, what logically happens after they catch this Jedi, but it didn't. They just kind of killed this guy and then fucked off off the planet, and Obi-Wan sees him there dead, and he's just like, oh, I feel bad. I should help that guy. So 
story logic is important, right? Because externally, our external logic as an audience, we're sitting there watching that and we're like, well, we know that this is how the Inquisitors operate, so this is how this should have happened. Uh, we don't understand why this random Jedi was able to so successfully track down Obi-Wan as opposed to the Inquisitors, whose job it is to track them down. They have all, all types of methods and techniques of doing so. And so that's one of the big issues, especially with the first episode of Obi-Wan, which is that it doesn't follow proper story logic. Another issue I had with the first episode of Obi-Wan, and this could be categorized as a nitpick, I guess, but like it still has something to do with like the overall like external logic of, of the show, is that when Obi-Wan goes and recovers his lightsabers, you know, he said earlier to the random Jedi, you know, bury your lightsabers in the sand and forget about them. And then later on, when Obi-Wan decides to come out of retirement to help save Leia, he travels into the middle of the desert and digs up his his buried lightsabers, like his lightsaber and Anakin's. And it, it, it's one of those things where it's like, well, how did he know where it was? I mean, like, it, it's very easy to kind of, you know, bury uh, something in the desert and then like not know where it's at, right? Especially if there's no GPS or like anything, uh, like a tracking fob or something that will lead you to that exact location because like he literally buried it out in the middle of the desert, right? Um, now, you could argue that he used the Force to sense where his lightsabers were and go there, but the show's already established that Obi-Wan doesn't use the Force, right? Um, the, all of Episode 2, like, you know, he's not using the Force because he, I guess he's cut himself off from it or he's not using it to avoid detection. For whatever reason, he's not using the Force. So somehow he's able to find his lightsabers that he buried in the desert randomly and you know we're never shown like how he finds these things he just kind of comes to a plot of sand starts digging and finds them right away and this is just one of those things where like it could have been very easily explained by the storytellers if he just had like a little tracking thing he goes there there's a little tracking device in the box so in case he ever needed to go find them he could but this is one of those things where like if he truly gave up his jedi ways then like he wouldn't have wanted to remember where he buried those lightsabers but we know because of episode four, he has Anakin's lightsaber and his own lightsaber. And so like he needs to uh, eventually find those things. And so like it would have been easier if he had just had them at his little cave thing and he like, you know, dug them up, opened them up and, and got his lightsabers out because that would have signified that even though he's hiding, he hasn't quite given up on being a Jedi just yet. And he's hoping to eventually kind of recapture his former glory and come back and be the hero that we know Obi-Wan Kenobi to be. And so, again, this goes back to kind of like this weird dichotomy of Jake Kenobi, uh, who is the guy who's basically the fallen hero and the prodigal hero and like he wants nothing to do. He's cut himself off from the force and he is no longer a Jedi and he's basically a defeated man versus the Obi-Wan who's quietly preparing and lying in wait and and being patient in the idea of eventually one day reemerging and taking down Darth Vader and the Empire. And uh, this is just one of those issues where like, yeah, you could look at it as a nitpick, but it's also part of a larger story problem that Obi-Wan Kenobi has as a TV show uh, in the sense that they don't know what Kenobi's character wants and what his motivation is. All right, so episode one of the Kenobi show was kind of played with bad pacing issues and bad plot logic issues. But overall, it was just kind of like a meh episode, right? It, it just, it was kind of like slow and boring, but it set up uh, the rest of the series. Episode two is where the show really starts to go off the rails, at least for me, in terms of like plot contrivances and uh, plot logic issues. So we're going to talk about those and, and go kind of in depth into them. Um, so I hope you're ready to get a little bit wonky on this. And the big part about episode two that really bothered me is this character of uh, Haja Estri, who's uh, played by actor uh, Kumil Nanjiani. Now, I actually like this character, and I like the actor who plays him, and I have no problems with the character itself. I do have a problem with how he was utilized within the larger story of episode two. And in addition to that, I also have an issue with how Leia was utilized in episode two, um, in the sense that uh, she acted in a way that basically was a contrivance to move the plot forward and not consistent with the character of Leia we know even at 10 years old. So I just want to take a minute here and talk about Haja Estri and Leia as the characters that were presented within the context of the Kenobi show. 
So basically, uh, Haja Estri is this guy who's a kind of a con man. He pretends to be a Jedi in order to get people to trust him so that he can kind of milk them for some credits in order to get them off planet. And uh, it seems that he's like deep down kind of like a good guy who, you know, is willing to help people. But he's also a little bit crooked in the sense that like, you know, he likes to manipulate people in order to make money. Um, which is a very interesting kind of character trait, you know. In addition to this, we also get introduced to young Leia, who is shown to be incredibly intelligent, even at a young age. Um, she's kind of wise beyond her years, and we see kind of glimpses of Padme in her, and we see glimpses of the future Princess Leia that we all know and love from the original trilogy. And there's a part in the show where basically Obi-Wan has to go to this uh, planet to track down Leia, and he meets up with Haja Estri and kind of reveals him to be a fraud, but Haja Estri kind of helps him track down Leia. And then Leia, at a certain point, decides that Obi-Wan is the reason why she was kidnapped and she doesn't trust him and she starts running away. And as Obi-Wan pursues her, they draw a lot of attention. Bounty hunters start descending upon him. They start shooting at them. Leia runs up to some rooftops and eventually gets in a situation where she puts herself in mortal peril and Obi-Wan is forced to, you know, break his vow not to use the force and save her life. And at that point she's like, oh, now I trust you. And this whole chain of events is so incredibly contrived because like basically they needed a reason for an action scene in the middle of the episode. And uh, they just decided, okay, Leia doesn't trust him anymore and he's gonna run off and she's gonna run off and he has to chase after her and put themselves in danger. Now, one of the issues with, with this is that you never want characters to act in a way that m makes the audience think that they're acting stupidly, right? Like you never want your characters to be to act dumber than your audience uh, believes them to be, especially for the sake of story contrivances. You know, I've heard people kind of come out and say like, oh, do you have kids? Like, you know, like, have you ever dealt with a 10 year old? They don't listen to you. They'll run off the, you know, you turn your back and they disappear. Again, this is external logic being applied to, to a show. But when, um, you know, you're dealing with a narrative, you always want to do what's in the best interest of the narrative as opposed to what's in the best interest of uh, external logic factors. And a lot of this is just justification for the bad writing that we saw in episode two in the sense that like, oh, well, if you have kids, you know that they don't listen to you and they run off and, and you know, they get you in trouble. Uh, the difference here is that I think most 10 year olds in the real world, once they start being shot at, would listen to the person who's actually trying to help them and protect them as opposed to continue to run away and put them in even greater danger. But, you know, I could be wrong with that. Um, but within the context of the story itself, the justification that Leia used to stop trusting Obi-Wan was very weak, right? Uh, you know, she saw the uh, the bounty alert that was put out in Obi-Wan, and she comes to the conclusion that she was kidnapped because they're really after Obi-Wan. It never occurred to her that they might be after him because he just sprung Leia from her captivity and, like, they're trying to track him down. Um, it, it, again, like, there are lots of leaps in logic in terms of, like, having to make this make sense within the context of the story itself. Now, this brings me back to uh, Haja Estri. So Haja Estri is a con man, he's a fake Jedi. And it would have been very interesting if the show had chosen to team him up with Obi-Wan, where instead of Obi-Wan going off by himself to rescue Leia, uh, Haja Estri goes along with him uh, as kind of like a guide to the city and it's kind of like a impromptu sidekick. And this way we get to learn more about him as a character as he helps Obi-Wan, he's kind of like the comic relief, and he can kind of be asking Obi-Wan why he doesn't use the Force and all this other stuff. And eventually, when they do rescue Leia, Leia eventually discovers that Haja Estri is a fraud, and she therefore assumes that Obi-Wan is a fraud as well, and that's what causes her to run away. And that would be the proper way in which to set up that whole chase scene where they're chasing after Leia because she doesn't trust them and all this other stuff. You know, it's just like little setups like that can go a long way. I don't know why they didn't do it that way. It was kind of weird. But Haja Estri also has more issues with him as a character in the show, where basically at a certain point he discovers that there's a big bounty on Obi-Wan, and he goes out to the rooftops where, you know, these other bounty hunters are shooting at Obi-Wan. He kind of looks out and he sees this happening. And then he sees Obi-Wan save Leia, I guess. They don't actually show this. 
but he sees him save Leia and using the Force to do so, and he realizes that Obi-Wan's an actual Jedi, and so instead of seeking out the bounty on Obi-Wan, he basically decides to help him out, because I guess he's a good guy. So even though the Inquisitors are in the city, they have it locked down, every bounty hunter in the city is looking for Obi-Wan, somehow Haja Estri tracks him down in the back alley. Don't ask me how. Again, this is like the random Jedi type thing where in episode one, the random Jedi found Obi-Wan where the Inquisitors couldn't find him for 10 years. And then in this episode, Haja Estri finds him in a back alley where the Inquisitors can't find him, even though they got the entire city locked down and every single bounty hunter in the city is looking for him. So magically, Haja Estri just kind of shows up and he says, okay, go to this place to get off planet. I'll give you as much time as I can which doesn't make a whole lot of sense because even though um, the Inquisitor Reva is kind of like trying to track down Kenobi and she's kind of batwomaning her way across like the rooftops to get to where she thinks Kenobi is, number one, I don't know if they established Haja Estri knows who Reva is. Like he might know who the Inquisitors are, but they didn't establish that he's uh, aware of, of Reva or the fact that she's the one behind the bounty. And number two, again, he just kind of appears where she appears. Like, how did he know that she was going to uh, drop down into that specific alley and uh, kind of like sacrifice himself for uh, this uh, Jedi that he doesn't know? Again, it would have been nice if they had established that his character always wanted to be a Jedi and he's inspired by actual Jedi. And so he's willing to sacrifice himself for that ideal. But we never really got that in this episode because they didn't really use his character all that much. So when he confronts Reva and says, I'm the Jedi you're looking for, and she knows he's a fake, it it just kind of like rings as a big plot contrivance as opposed to like a meaningful sacrifice that the character should have been making at that point. And then to make matters even worse, uh, Reva uses the Jedi mind probe on him where basically she just uses the force to read his mind. And uh, at this point, um, you know, we're not, we did, weren't aware as an audience if you hadn't you know, read any of the expanded universe or watch any of the cartoon shows that uh, Jedi um, in this time period knew how to do that. Now we know because of The Force Awakens that Kylo Ren can use the Jedi mind probe in order to interrogate people and, and find out stuff that they have locked away in their head. But if Haja Estri had just gone with Obi-Wan and Leia and led them to this, this place instead of confronting Reva and being like, you know, mind probed, he would have done much more for them because like by being mind probed, he revealed where they were going and put them in danger. And so it, it's just one of those things where like they should have put Haja Estri in a position where like he wasn't willing to sacrifice himself and willingly like get mind probed and stuff like that. It should have been something that uh, Reva did to him in order to find out where Obi-Wan was because she knew that Haja Estri had helped them out. And this just goes to, to story logic stuff. But, you know, so while speaking of story logic, now that the Jedi mind probe has been revealed that Reva can do it, why wasn't she doing that on Tatooine? Like that, that scene again with, uh, with Owen, where she's like, I'm going to kill this guy if you guys don't tell me where the Jedi is, right? Couldn't she just go to each one of those people and just like Jedi mind probe them and figure out what they know and then like, you know, just by process of elimination, uh, find the Jedi that way? instead of threatening to kill people. Uh, I mean, I mean, you had three Inquisitors on that planet, and we assume that they all know how to do the mind probe trick. So why weren't they just doing that? Uh, anytime you want to track down a Jedi, just mind probe the, the different people and get the information and then follow those leads. Why do you have to go around threatening to kill them with your lightsaber if you can just like pull what you want out of their brain? Again, story logic. It's important. When you set this up, you always have to ask yourself as a storyteller, okay, how does this impact other aspects of the story that I'm telling? It's kind of like in The Last Jedi when they introduced this concept of hyperfuel and, you know, like running out of gas and like these like space chases and stuff like that. Or even something like the Holdo maneuver where they use the ship to light speed into a, a bigger ship and destroy it. And then like you have the entire audience asking, well, if they can do that, why haven't they done that before? And why can't they do that after this, you know? So when you set up something like the Jedi mind probe, where you can like read someone's mind and get the information you need out of it, the audience starts asking, okay, well, why haven't you been using that up to this point? Why did you need to kidnap Leia? Why couldn't you have just gone to Bail Organa and Jedi mind probed him and figure out what he knew and where, you know, Kenobi was? So like, you know, there's a lot of stuff like that, that 
you have to ask yourself as an audience member when you're watching a poorly crafted TV show, movie, or story. Does the story logic make sense? And the answer is it doesn't. And this is amplified by the multiple plot contrivances of just having stuff happen because the plot you know, can't move forward unless this thing happens. So like uh, Haja Estri was just a big plot contrivance, you know, like he was there to tell uh, uh, Obi-Wan where Leia was. And then like he was there to help them get off the planet when they needed to. And he was there to reveal to um, Reva uh, where they had run off to so that she could track them down and confront them. So like, you know, none of this stuff happens organically. When you're at, when you're crafting a, a good story, you always want this stuff. You always want plot points to kind of naturally occur throughout the cause and effect setup and payoff process of uh, telling a properly structured narrative. And episode two of Obi-Wan did not do that to the extreme. I mean, to the point where it was actually annoying to me. Uh, you know, I was watching this thing and I was like, oh, just, oh, come on, you know, just please. Could, could someone who just understands basic plotting come in and rewrite this and make it make sense? Because there was, there was so much potential there to have a really good episode of Kenobi that's gonna lead into the rest of the series and it just wasn't there. It, it just, it, it almost got to that point uh, multiple times. And then like the story would be like, nope, we're just going to go and be lazy and stupid. And you guys are going to like it because the show is called Obi-Wan Kenobi. And it's got the Star Wars banner on it. And you just uh, have to like it and consume product and move on to other product. And speaking of plot logic issues, um, there's another thing that occurred because of the Mandalorian, which is basically the introduction of these things called tracking fobs, which is what bounty hunters seem to use in order to track down people across vast distances in the galaxy. And I've seen a lot of people online, rightfully so, say like, hey, why aren't the Inquisitors or the bounty hunters just using tracking fobs to find Obi-Wan Kenobi? Like, you know, that's a thing in the Star Wars universe. Why aren't they utilizing this technology that no one's ever really bothered to explain how it works? Um, but uh, it just magically does. And so, like, it's part of the canon. And, you know, why don't they use it? And that's a really good question. It's like, why aren't the Inquisitors using tracking fobs to track down all the Jedi, especially someone like Obi-Wan Kenobi? And the only answer I can have that justifies this is that the technology for the tracking fobs hasn't been invented yet. Uh, maybe it's like a, a post uh, Return of the Jedi thing where uh, basically uh, the technology to use tracking fobs suddenly comes into play and bounty hunters adopt this technology and start using them. We don't know because it's never really been established in the story. And because it's never been established in the story, we have to wonder why aren't they using this technology right now, right? Like why? Like how is uh, Obi-Wan hiding from tracking fob technology? And this is something that because of the Mandalorian should have at least been addressed in, uh, in this show, whether or not it be like starting off episode one with the Inquisitors saying like, you know, oh, the, the tracking fob technology is not yet complete, but once it is, we shall track down every Jedi and that's when we will find Kenobi or something along those lines, just to kind of establish that they don't have that technology yet or something. Otherwise, you have like this big kind of like retroactive plot hole, thanks to the Mandalorian, which is like, why aren't the Inquisitors using this technology if it's so effective at like kind of tracking down the general area of a certain person? And why aren't the bounty hunters in this city using that technology to try to find uh, Obi-Wan as he gallivants around the, the back alleys with, uh, with young Princess Leia? So that's a, that's a really big kind of like issue. And it's another thing where, like, if Bail Organa wanted to track down his daughter, why isn't he sending out half of the Alderaan army with tracking fobs to, to find her? You know, like, like there's a lot of stuff um, that just doesn't make any sense within the logic of the story itself and the stuff that we've set up within the Star Trek universe that is at play in this show that really needs to be addressed and isn't. Another issue I have with episode two is just like the, the unwillingness of Obi-Wan to utilize the force in his quest to basically save Princess Leia. Like we established in episode one that he dug up his lightsabers um, once more in order to basically get the utility that he needs in order to go on this quest to save Princess Leia. And so the episode ends with basically us, the audience, seeing that like, okay, Obi-Wan is now, a, you know, 
a Jedi again as he goes off planet to go on this quest. And when he comes back, he'll probably like, you know, revert back to Ben Kenobi, who is not a force user. But as the episode goes along, it becomes kind of obvious that for whatever reason, Obi-Wan still isn't willing to use the force, even on a on such an important mission as to save Princess Leia. And um, there are lots of, of instances throughout the episode where like if he had been using the force, he could have been far more effective and far safer in, in rescuing the princess. So, for instance, when he's breaking into the uh, spice lab on the planet, um, there's a there's a uh, scene where basically he's walking down this hallway and these two drug smugglers kind of come out. And they're like, what are you doing back here? And he starts like fighting with them, uh, like right off the bat, like physically fighting with them. When in reality, you know, if Obi-Wan had just used a Jedi mind trick, he probably could have just like easily walked past those guys and not have to worry about it. Um, the same thing when he's kind of ambushed by Flea in um, in the, the fake cell. And uh, he uses like this big vial of spice to kind of like disable the, the guys who are, are holding him there when he could have just easily force pushed these guys against the wall and knocked them out or something along those lines. Um, so there's lots of situations where, and also like when Leia starts running away from him in the alley, he could have just used the force to levitate her, bring her back to him. And that would have convinced her that he actually was a Jedi and that would have nipped that thing in the bud right away. So there's lots of instances throughout this episode where if Obi-Wan was just using the force, it would have made a lot more sense and it would have made the, the mission a lot easier for him. And it would have made the audience believe it's like, OK, well, like he has these abilities, um, you know, he's using them. Uh, it makes sense within the context of the story. Now, I've heard a lot of th- people kind of like defend uh, his non-use of the force by saying like, oh, it's been 10 years and like he's rusty and he's forgotten to use some of this stuff and blah, blah, blah. But that doesn't really make any sense because Obi-Wan's been trained since he was a kid to use the force. And it's it's basically like another appendage to him by this point in in his life. Like he's used the force so many times uh, that, you know, it's kind of like riding a bicycle. Like, you know, when you learn to ride a bicycle as a kid, you don't forget how to ride a bicycle, even if you haven't ridden a bicycle for like 20 years. As an adult, you can still get on a bicycle and ride it because you learned early on how to do it. And this is one of those things where like, you you know, like if you look at Yoda, Yoda went into exile just like Kenobi did. But Yoda, you know, by the time Luke finds him in Empire Strikes Back, he still knows how to use the force. He probably hasn't used it all that much in that time, but he still knows how to use it. And uh, when it comes to uh, like Jake Skywalker, like Jake Skywalker, you know, effed off uh, to this island and sealed himself off in the force and hasn't used it in, you know, God knows how long. And then like he force projects himself halfway across the galaxy, you know, because he just knew how to do it. Um, once you're a force user, you're always a force user. It's like, you know, learning how to walk or, or like ride a bike or something like that. You don't just forget how to use it, especially basic stuff like levitation and things of that nature. If they didn't establish that Obi-Wan cut himself off from the force, much like Jake Skywalker did in The Last Jedi. And so like he just never uses the force or like he chooses not to use the force because that's a surefire way for the Inquisitors to find him. That would be one thing, but that needs to be set up early on in the, in the show. And also, like, when he's on this different planet and he's trying to find Leia and save her, it doesn't make sense for him to continue to hide um, because, you know, even if the Inquisitors know he's on that planet, he can just fuck back off to Tatooine and stop using the Force again, and then, like, they can't, again, like, they can't find him. So it's, it's one of those things that just doesn't make sense, and from a story perspective, that needs to be set up as to why he's not using his powers, and um, also, like, they, they need to make it clear that he didn't forget how to use these powers. He just chose not to use them, except uh, at the point where he chooses to use them to save Leia's life. And, and by that point, after he already reveals himself to be a Jedi and, and, you know, reveal that he remembers how to use his Force powers, he should be using that stuff left and right. Jedi mind tricks to get them out of, you know, bad situations, uh, you know, doing, like, the whole thing where, you know, like, he flicks his fingers and people think they hear a sound so like their attention is drawn elsewhere uh force pushing force speed force leaping uh you know using his lightsaber all types of stuff like like there really should have been like uh oh obi-wan is back moment type thing and they just didn't do that and i think that's a failure of the writing again like they need like when you have a prodigal hero situation 
where you have like a hero who's kind of beaten down, he's at his lowest point, and we're seeing him kind of like rise back up to his former glory. You need to have these moments where like you establish what the character can't or won't do, and then slowly show him kind of realize, oh, I can do this, I will do this, I have to do this, and then that's part of his character growth throughout the course of the narrative. And Obi-Wan just fails at that, and not the character of the show, Obi-Wan Kenobi the show fails at that on pretty much every level. So I know there's a lot of things I could say about the look and feel of the show, about the dialogue, about the overall writing and stuff like that, the direction, uh, the costume design, the character design. If you wanted, you could probably go through each and every one of these episodes minute by minute and break it down and, and criticize it. I'm not really going to do that. I think that it's important to note that, okay, certain creative choices were made. They committed to those choices. You got to respect that. But within that, once they've committed to it and they've put it out as a finished product, they have to be open to acknowledging their mistakes. And most of the mistakes or most of the issues I had with the show just come down to poorly written stuff. Plot logic, details, uh, plot contrivances, uh, inconsistencies within the Star Wars universe, things like that. Basic stuff that should have been covered at some point in the production process that either slipped through the cracks or was completely ignored. And, you, you know, I keep going back to this thing about, like, you know, the people who love Star Wars no matter what, they're going to love it just as much, if not more, if the story's properly told. And the people who are hypercritical and don't like Star Wars anymore because they feel betrayed and they feel like, you know, like it's gone off a cliff and it's just not worth their time anymore. If the show bothered to treat it with care and, you know, tell the story right, those people would like it as well. And so you appeal to the broadest possible Star Wars audience. And, you know, if you look at the first two seasons of The Mandalorian, that's pretty much what they did. I mean, the first two seasons of The Mandalorian aren't like high art. The writing for that show is, is not anything special. It's just not terrible. It's not bad. It's not filled with like really glaring plot contrivances and plot holes and, uh, and pacing issues and stuff like that. It's just a decent TV show and people went gaga over it. And so like you don't, there, there's not a high bar for success when it comes to creating Star Wars content. You just need to have it be not bad. And Obi-Wan Kenobi, you know, for all of its promise, like falls short of, the, of that. Like, like if mediocre were right here, Obi-Wan Kenobi would be just under it. Like, like, like it's, it's not even um, reaching mediocre levels. It's just kind of like disappointing to bad in terms of the writing. Now, of course, we got four more episodes to go, and I'll probably break down those episodes as they come out. But I'm really disappointed with the first two episodes in the sense that this, these storytelling decisions that were made for these first two episodes are just so rudimentary bad. You know, like it, it's the type of thing where like if you take a screenwriting seminar and within like the first couple hours they cover how not to do this stuff. Did no one at Lucasfilm ever take a screenwriting course or a storytelling course? Did they never take an English class? Did they never take a, a fiction writing class? Did they never actually bother to study the hero's journey or the master plots or Shakespeare or like pretty much anything that a typical writer would go through in order to kind of perfect their craft? A lot of this stuff basically comes down to the talent behind the storytelling of the Star Wars universe. And, you know, Kathleen Kennedy, for all of her faults, if she was just good enough to hire good writers and good storytellers to make these shows, it would be a completely different ballgame. But for whatever reason, the showrunners that they get for these Star Wars TV shows and the writers and directors that they get for, like, the movies and stuff like that just don't seem to have, like, the, the fundamental foundation of good storytelling technique in order to deliver on the promise of a good Star Wars movie. Um, I think that's been kind of, like, emblematic of Kathleen Kennedy's reign as the head of Lucasfilm is, is like she makes the wrong hiring choices consistently uh, from project to project to project. The only thing that she kind of got right was letting Jon Favreau come in and, you know, take care of uh, the Mandalorian show, which was basically just like, you know, an adaptation of the script they had for the Boba Fett show way back in 2014 when she was like developing all these character centric uh, movies. And the fact that Jean Favreau is actually like a good writer, like, you know, he got to start with Swingers and uh, he kind of worked his way up and did Iron Man. Like, like he's a guy who knows the fundamentals of storytelling. He doesn't always follow them, but at least like, you know, he's competent enough to deliver an entertaining finished product. Unfortunately, 
it seems that most of the people involved in Star Wars don't have that type of background. And I want to separate out like Deborah Chow as, as the director, even though she's kind of like the, uh, the final arbiter of the creative choices. Directors for TV shows don't really have a lot of say in like how they end up. It's usually the showrunners. And uh, the showrunners are, are like the, the producers who kind of oversee the entire show. And they're the head writer and they're the ones who kind of like run the writer's room and stuff like that. I don't know the process behind the Star Wars TV shows, how exactly uh, that's run if Deborah Chow was indeed the showrunner and the one who was kind of overseeing the, the different scripts. Because if, if she was, then this is completely her failure. But it also seems like um, the uh, the story group for Lucasfilm might have had some type of input into this and, and they've proven to be... Uh, you know, making bad decisions like left and right over the course of like all of Lucasfilm's projects ever since they were implemented. And, you know, it's it just gets frustrating after a while because it's not that hard to understand basic fundamental storytelling concepts like, like you know, uh, a sixth grade English class can teach you this stuff. Go out and buy Story by Robert McKee at your local Barnes and Noble and read through that book once and you'll have like more knowledge of how a good fictional story is told than most of the people working at Lucasfilm right now. It's really not that difficult and it's very disappointing that you have a, a legendary legacy character like Obi-Wan Kenobi who's getting his own show and the writing is just failing the character left and right. Now, can this change course and end up being a great show after two disappointing starting episodes? Sure, not everything starts off all that well, but as long as it ends well, people are going to like it. However, I don't have a lot of faith in Lucasfilm, simply because they've proven time and time again to not stick to the landing, I guess is the nice way of saying it. So we'll see how episode three goes, and hopefully by uh, episode six, We've got like a really good Star Wars tale that uh, is based around this beloved character. I don't have a lot of faith that that's going to happen, but we are going to see. Anyway, guys, this is Matthew Kadish, producer of the Salty Nerd Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in to this rambling video essay of mine. I hope you got a lot out of it. And uh, be sure to check out the channel. Uh, we do a lot of movie reviews and movie analysis and fun stuff like that. And uh, we do it all with a little bit of salt, so it's meant to be kind of fun and tongue-in-cheek. I guarantee you my co-hosts on the Salty Nerd podcast are a lot more entertaining than I am. I'm kind of the, the brainiac and film guy on, uh, on the show. But uh, uh, if you check out our main episodes, uh, we have a lot of fun. We have a lot of laughs kind of talking about this stuff. Anyway, guys, thank you so much, and stay salty, my friends.